Thank you so much for your patience. That's just two minutes from now. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. And uh, we, we want to uh, welcome all our participants um, as we wait for those two minutes. OK. Hello, Isaac. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Rose and team. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So I think that's our five minutes. <laughs> So I'll welcome everyone to this uh, uh, series of uh, scholarly writing uh, webinars. We are pleased to have you. Uh, my name is Florence and I am honored to be hosting two very lovely, very inspiring, very knowledgeable, and uh, like one of them said, ladies that you would like to meet. Um, and uh, they are both called Rose. So uh, I'm happy to have Dr. Rose uh, Rose Navidye and Dr. Rose Clark Nanyonga. Um, uh, Dr. Rose, <laughs> yes, that's Dr. Rose and Dr. And Dr. Rose Navidye, please wave. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for making time for this. Uh, but most importantly, thank you so much that you are championing uh, moving the, the work of nurses in Uganda forward, that you are making the effort to advocate for their space and that you're making the time and uh, investing uh, resources like time and energy and knowledge into making the nursing profession in Uganda much better, recognizable, uh, but also uh, giving them the place that they, rightf they rightfully deserve at uh, most of the very important tables that they should be sitting at where uh, they are most of the time uh, ignored. Um, Dr. Rose and Dr. Rose, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be sharing with us what, what is it that we can do, what are those strategies that we can employ to ensure that the works of nurses are written about, that they're out there, that the voices of nurses are heard. I know in these past two years, nurses have been saying a lot. We have heard, but as you know, social media, we, we will listen today, tomorrow there will be another story. But one, once it's down in print and uh, in, in platforms where, the, in platforms that actually matter, then no one will forget. And these two ladies are moving that agenda forward. We are looking at how do we support the enhancement of scholarly writing among nurses and midwives, speaking about the works we have. Yes, we do, we do have challenges and we talk about them a lot, but, can we move those challenges and speak of them in ways that can be heard, in ways that can make people understand to audiences that can actually move, that can act. So please join me in welcoming Dr. First, we'll start with Dr. Rose Navidia, and then we shall move on to Dr. Rose Clark. You are free to post any questions that you may have in the chat, and we shall share those at the end of the talk uh, for each of the ladies. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Dr. Rose Navidia. Thank you, Boris. Uh, thank you, Florence, <laughs> uh, for that warm welcome. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for, for hosting me on this day webinar. Uh, today, I'll talk about use of data to tell our stories in order to drive or advocate effectively for policy decision making.
Okay, and I'm Rose, as I have been introduced. I'm a nurse educator, nurse medical educator. Currently at the city of my university. Uh, so um, we shall make a quick review of scholarly writing and basically talk about its characteristics. Then we shall look at use of data to influence change. We shall talk about, about what is data how, and how to collect it and uh, then how to use it. And we shall briefly talk about advocacy because Florence, as you said, um, for us to, to be written about, there must be some sort of advocacy process for people to know that we are also out there and we are doing some good work. And uh, some solutions, storytelling. This is something which I came about it's new to me too, but I thought I would share. <clears throat> so, by way of reviewing scholarly writing, scholarly writing is also known as academic writing. And uh, we know that uh, as nurses, not all of us data to do what? To influence change wherever we are, wherever we are working, be it on the world, uh, be it in a, an organization, anywhere. So uh, this one I'm just reviewing uh, um, that uh, is also academic writing. There are different styles for different institutions maybe their dissertation or how they write their report. So in scholarly writing, you have to follow the, the institution's format, okay? And uh, the characteristics, the major characteristics are that you must have a strong argument or statement or research question. And this one usually you get it through analysis and synthesis of literature. Um, it must be logical with appropriate scope, okay? And uh, it incorporates supporting evidence. You must cite everything. You, you have to, to, to have evidence by data to, to write about something. It, it utilizes reliable and peer-reviewed sources. Uh, uh, peer-reviewed means that the, um, what you write will be reviewed by peers in that, in that field. Um, this could be uh, senior people in the field to see that what you're writing is really um, in line. And it must be clear and in a formal tone. It must also be consistent and, citation, and, and the citations um, also consistent with what the organization requires. Some organizations use APA, others Harvard, Oxford, Vancouver, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a formal sort of academic writing. And uh, when I was requested to, to talk about scholarly writing and how we can use data to, to influence change, I'm like, wow. Not everybody is in academia. So uh, how do we go about this? So having reviewed the scholarly writing in summary, uh, I will go straight to, to use of data. We all know that led with the lamb, Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. And what is known about her is that she used the data to reduce infections among her Crimean War patients who had been injured. And she did this, to, uh, she advocated for change to improve the sanitation around this, uh, the wards. I don't know whether there was, it was a ward or whatever, but she advocated for change so that the patients could do improve because she, she, she was able to show whoever was in charge, that the, the sanitation was important. And that's why these people were getting infections. 
So, as nurses being descendants of Nightingale in the profession, we should also follow suit. Uh, many at a time we, we, we just go and do perform our task and we don't even bother to, to take note of anything. And yet if we were doing this, definitely we would be in the news for, for doing the right thing, for influencing change, for showing what is required to be done if we have to have a healthy population. So when we talk about use of data to influence change, we first of all, let's understand what data is. What is data? And uh, I think this was Wikipedia. It is a set of values or qualitative values of qualitative or quantitative variables about one or more persons or objects. And another person said, data is a collection of facts, such as numbers, words, measurements, observations, or just descriptions of things. Just look at that. We cannot fail to get numbers, to get measurements, to have observation, wherever we are working. So we can actually collect data and make, try to advocate for change. This data can be quantitative or qualitative. Qualitative is descriptive. It is descriptive information. You just describe something. You just describe your feel, your experience, whatever it is. While quantitative data is numerical information. It's about numbers. It's about numbers. So uh, quantitative data, you can have two types, discrete and continuous. The discrete data is that one which can be counted. For example, number of patients, number of deaths, number of deliveries, okay? While continuous is measured data, for example, the weight, the height, um, yeah, temperature, blood pressure, this, this is the continuous data, continuous and quantitative. So how do we use data to advocate effectively? Um, now this is advocacy, advocacy comes in. And uh, according to this website where I got this, advocacy is the act Wow, I'm being told my internet is messed up. The act of pleading or arguing in favor of something, such as a cause, a policy, or interest, or active support of an idea or cause. So that is advocacy. Advocacy simply means supporting something, showing support for something. And I think your thing has fallen. Uh, are we together? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Rose. Continue. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you. So, so that is advocacy. It is just showing support for something. And if I remember, clear uh, as nurses and midwives. We, are, we have the advocacy role, okay? But we cannot advocate for our patients, so for our colleagues, if we don't have the, this data to support, okay? Yeah, so there are three major steps for advocacy. I read somewhere there, there may be more, but I thought these ones would be simpler. So you define the purpose or need for data, okay? For example, the recent strike, it was due to lunch allowance. So if, if, you, if you want maybe to advocate for us to be given lunch, 
Can we have some data to show uh, whoever we want to, to, to talk to, to hear us about this lunch? How much do the nurses earn? How much is lunch? The nurses have, uh, you know, have other obligations. This little money, can it really be enough? And if, if you, you, can you really work without lunch? And then you can also bring in other organizations. I can see other organizations, they organize lunch, they, you know, they give their, their uh, employees lunch, they do ABCD. So when you collect this data and put it uh, on the table, someone can see that. I think these people have, have a what? There is, there is sense in what they are saying. We need a directorate for nursing. I, I just put it down some examples, but there are so many things which we may, we may want to look for data to support. Directorate of nursing and midwifery. Why, why, why would we want it? How would it help us? So you collect this data and put it and have it. The, we may need more nurses and midwives because we are short staffed, we, you know, bring out what does WHO say, nurse patient ratio, what are other countries having, and why are, why are we having one nurse per 11,000 people? So, so that someone can see a sense. Then after we have collected this sort of information, which we want to support us, then we, 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 we use various methods to collect, and then we have to ex explain this data out. And of course, these ones may be, they are different. We are at different levels. If I'm at a ward, man, a ward I may want the hospital director to hear me out. Or the, if I'm at working at the district, the, the DHO, if um, I'm at the headquarters, maybe it is the minister, the MPs, and so on and so forth. So there are different people whom we we approach to to try and advocate for our cause. So uh, the definition defining the purpose of data. Why is it important? It helps us to illustrate a need. It reduces uncertainty. It helps us to inform a public opinion. It helps to substantiate for others what you already know in your day-to-day -day experiences. Um, if I can give an example here, as, as a ward manager, you know, sometimes we complain, well, they don't give us gloves. We don't have enough for whatever, like now in this COVID-19 era, there were no enough PPEs. But if you don't like put together these figures to show, maybe the hospital administrator, the hospital administrator for him, his work is to make sure that the hospital is run at the minimum cost. So he may not understand why he wants so many boxes of gloves. If you don't show him that, in this medical world, we have so many patients, they are like this, and we need gloves, we, we change so many times, you, have, you know, so that they understand before they can really, um, try to, to give us what we want. The purpose also defines the type of data to collect. Whether you, are, you want people data, for example, about age, race, gender, I, do you want events data, birth, dates, deaths? Do you want to talk about places? Maybe you want to, to, to show that the people who in this area, they are malnourished because they don't have enough food. In fact, this places data reminds me when I was a young midwife working in the labor suit in Lago Hospital. We, we were working with one midwife and she made an exclamation one time. I don't know why people who come from our place, Bamnanika, are the ones who always fail to, to push. They always end up having scissors. And 
having gone through research and, and all that, this sort of training, I, I, I think about that statement and say, wow, I wish we had an, a research mind. We would have, you know, formulated the question, why people from this area, why most of them uh, come and they, they, they can't push their children. I think they were, they were malnourished. And remember this, Mamnanika is in the World Triangle. And that time, I think the, the war had already set in. People, people didn't have food. Yeah. So, but it just passed. And this midwife was like, I don't know. Our people are the ones who end up in the theater. And, and, and it passed like that. Then another one observed that these people, I think these people, I, don't, I wouldn't like to, to deliver a woman from this place because they, tend, they end up having PPH. So if we had data, maybe we would try to find out why people from a certain area, I will not mention why they were having PPH. Is it the food? Is, what is it? Is it, uh, do they take long to come? What, 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 what brings this? And is it true that actually most of them who come from there are the ones who get PPH? So that was, those were two like questions which we would have researched on and I think by now it would be very far. So collecting data, we collect as we work, okay? We should be observant, we should observe, we should observe. What happens? The women who are dying, what is the need? The people who are getting bed sores, what is happening? Is it the nursing care? What is it that brings this particular phenomenon? You observe. Then we can also conduct surveys. These are like uh, their research. It is like a formal research. You can conduct a survey. You will review. You can review reports and extract data. You can review national census uh, uh, reports or national service like the UDHS and the others from who from United Nations and so on. So that, that's where we get it data. So we observe, we conduct survey, and we can also review documents. So how do we explain our data if we are trying to advocate for something? We explain so that um, we make people understand us. So you present it in a form that best presents your case. Here I can give an example. You know why maternal and child health has been given HIV AIDS. People presenting data, which people understood, which bodies understood. You uh, you know, like telling politicians that, that this is the slogan now that every day we lose a full minibus of women during the river due to maternal causes. That one who doesn't understand a minibus of 14 to 17 people dying every day. So someone it will it will click. Other than saying that, you know, we lose 300 and 37 women per 100,000. That one, it will take a lot of time for people to understand and relate. So they will say, what, so what? 337 per 100,000? It will even look so little by down. Okay. And also, uh, when we are explaining data, it depends on the audience it is intended for. So if it is um, for academics who will ask you about the chi-square and pi and everything, then you bring in all those statistical things for them to understand because they are academicians. 
if they are politicians, they don't have time. You have like to summarize, I'm saying, you put your visual is more powerful than the audio. You put in a, a graph, oh, if I charge, so whatever, I'm sure that you see this is big. Because if someone sees a pie chart and the red one is like 80%, someone will be able to understand that this is really a big problem. You also calculate the figures, okay? So you put in charts, you put in maps to show trends, progress, patterns, or differences. But the intention is to make your audience understand you so that they see the reason for change. So when you are also explaining your data, you do the basics. You don't have to be a statistician, you no, know, but you can, you know, calculate frequencies, you can calculate rates, you can calculate percentages, and these are like, simple for any other person to understand. Even those politicians who are very busy, they'll be able to understand. If you are saying that, you know, in this world, out of the um, 40% or four of out of every 100, or four out of 10 of all women who get C-section, they get infected, they get infection, then that one raises, you know, four, almost half. What is the problem? Okay. You also take the time to explore the data sources available to you and practice using data to make your advocacy even more compelling. So you explore the data available to you. That means you don't only use uh, what you are seeing, but you also read around you other sources. To, to support your argument, to support your argument. Maybe you are advocating to, to, to have, let me see this. We have very many patients on the floor and there is no money, but we need to tell, we want to tell our leaders that you know what, we need the beds if we have to reduce on this rate of infection. We cannot have mothers deliver and then they sit here. So you read, you sleep on the floor, and then they are crowded. So when you read this other literature, it will be able to support that. You know, there is um, a chance of, you know, people getting sepsis or getting infected. Um, so data can be a powerful tool in our efforts to improve policy, if we present them well. So this the last thing which I said, I, I came across it and I thought I would share. I found something called solution storytelling. Because the other one, when we are telling our stories, we are actually, talking about the problems, it's like this, we are suffering, we are stressed, we are ABCD. But in this social storytelling, they are saying that we can effectively communicate our story without focusing on the problem initially, but still motivate the public and policymakers to enact policy change. So the advice that you can begin with an effective solution or intervention, and then follow the definition of the problem. Maybe if I can, um, what can I give an example? Of? Okay, if we are advocating for government to invest in higher education for nurses, for example, so maybe we start by saying nurses. Nursing education, higher education for nurses helps improve patient outcomes. Okay. And then you start
Dr. Rose, we, you are, um, we can't hear you very well. The solution, if we, if we, we... Really? Uh, when, where did you stop hearing me from? Oh, now you are clear. Um, go ahead, because oh. we, we have only one minute left. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and I think this is the last slide. So you, you start with um, an effective solution or intervention, and then follow the definition of the problem. I was giving an example of the, of the um, if we are advocating for government to invest in nursing education, higher education for nurses, then we shall have to, to show, to give that when, if nurses are highly ed educated, the patient outcomes are better, and then you talk about the problem. Now, now we start talking, you see now the, the, the bulk of the nursing workforce is that certificate and so on and so forth. And then maybe people can, can hear. Other than starting with the problem that we have certificate nurses as the bulk, then people will just go off. Um, so this type of story will show that you know how to solve problems and that no problem is too severe that cannot be solved if we work together. The, uh, yeah. And uh, when you start with solutions, you lift the public's desire to collect code. You need to support for higher taxes uh, if they get money to what you have to talk about, targeted at risk populations. And you receive more attention for being unique out as influence opens the, the talk. So how to tell solutions still, connect to the community, how the larger community benefits. Um, include the big picture thinking, tell your story about effective in interventions in terms of the broader context. Make it necessary, not just nice. Focus on how a particular solution works. And inspire action and prove effectiveness. So this one now, you may prove effectiveness by, you know, giving the, the data about how, how this helps. So um, thank you for listening to me. That's all I had. Uh, uh, but I also know that uh, we are very senior people here is open to discussion, addition for the same. Over to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. I just, I think we'll take uh, questions after uh, Dr. Rose Clark's talk, uh, but just one, one quick one that I've seen, someone says the explanation for solution story is not clear. They, they would like another example. Perhaps that, that one we can explore for Dr. Rose, Navigo. They would like to better understand how to. You want me to 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 answer now? Yes, just to 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 share an example of how uh, an explanation for solution storytelling, and then we shall do the other questions later. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, how to tell the solutions story. Um, I said that you start, you start your story by focusing on the, on the solution, on the solution. I gave an example of the, if you want government to advance, to support, to invest in higher education for nurses. But maybe I can get another example. Maybe we are looking at maternal mortality. And uh, you see in your unit, uh, the women who, 
who die, maybe it's because they come late. I'm just giving an example. And you have noted this maternal, maternal death happened because the mother came in late. Where does she come from? The other one also came late. So instead of um, uh, starting by saying that um, um, late arrival to the hospital is causing us a lot of maternal death. Let's talk, talk about the solution first. What is the solution? Maybe if we have coupons, because I have seen this one has worked elsewhere. If we can introduce a coupons program whereby women can get to the hospital, we give the, the, the coupons and the, the border border riders can bring them as fast as they can because they know they will be paid. Because we know that the, the mothers, they may not be coming to hospital in time because, they, because of distance, but they may not be having money and so on and so forth. So the solution is now providing transport. So you start by saying that if we provide the transport to these women, they will reach early in the hospital. Hmm? And we shall avoid maternal death due to late coming. Those delays in maternal, okay? So I don't know whether that one is, is clear. You start with the solution. If we provide transport to all mothers who are pregnant, if we can identify them and give them these coupons while in the, they are in the third trimester, it will help them reach the hospital early and we shall reduce on the maternal death due to later arrival to the hospital. I don't know, uh, Florence, whether that is a bit clear. Yes, it's clear. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, so we'll put our questions in the chat. Uh, let's have Dr. Ross Clark as well deliver a talk and then we, we delve into the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dr. Ross Clark. Thank you so much, uh, Florence. I want to uh, welcome all our participants to the webinar. Um, that you know we have a, a pretty good attendance, uh, which means that people put value on a scholarly writing, whether you are a nurse uh, or a midwife or another healthcare provider, public health, and so on. I want to. Um, recognize colleagues and uh, senior administrators of CIU who are on the call, and also um, recognize that both Dr. Chalo and I, uh, and as well as uh, uh, Ms. Florence are supported by uh, the HEPI initiative to run these webinars to strengthen capacity for nurses and midwives um, in within uh, for leadership as well as, as scholarly writing and this is our second webinar so we are building on some of the things that we talked about uh, previously um, today we are focusing uh, on uh, as uh, Dr. Rose already um, uh, mentioned, uh, thank you, Dr. Rose, uh, for your presentation. So she really focused on the use of data uh, in scholarly writing or the use of evidence uh, to, to communicate and frame our issues and all frame our solutions. I am going to uh, focus uh, my talk on um, key principles of scholarly writing. Um, and I really want to bring this uh, to uh, the personal level uh, because for all of us to um, undertake this journey to start writing, we have to start somewhere. And majority of what we need first uh, before we can lobby for institutional strengthening and cultures that allow us to to write and publish and so on and so forth, we uh, need to start at a personal level. So some of the key uh, principles of um, scholarly writing that I'm going to highlight for in our webinar today, uh, focus on the individual journey, the individual skilling, the understanding, 
things that we need to change, practices that we need to change, behaviors that we need to change uh, to be able to improve our scholarly writing. Um, uh, the relevance of scholarly writing, uh, as Dr. Rose already touched on this, is this is a form of communication and a necessary skill important to the nurse and mid midwife's role, you know, both as a clinician, as a professional, as a leader, as a scholar, as an educator, and of course, as a, uh, an advocate. But first, you know, social awareness and advocacy campaigns that we have been uh, talking about um, lead to, you know, a highlighting of an issue that is often so close um, to, to what we are doing, uh, often identified within, you know, our own practices. Uh, we also, of course, need scholarly writing to educate people and communities. We need scholarly writing um, as a means to state the position and influence of nursing and midwifery. And this is an area of growing need for us in Uganda, uh, given some of the recent events. We need uh, scholarly writing when we are, of course, if you are in education for, for grants, uh, for publication, for academia, for tenure promotions and so on and so forth. And we also need scholarly writing uh, as a part of our reflective practice, which is a professional expectation for nurses and midwives to demonstrate their commitment, their commitment to lifelong learning. And you know, recently, um, we cannot get away from the fact that many nurses are working as in, in business uh, positions, they are working as politicians, they are working as academicians, they are working as clinicians at the bedside. Um, they take on multiple roles and they are required to write, you know, business or strategic plans, report writing, you know, submitting annual reports, memos. Uh, of course, we are required to write for publication, uh, policy briefs, and even letters and emails um, that the use of data and coherency and logical approaches to the way we frame these narratives requires an integration of scholarly writing. In the past, I think people thought, or oh, when you talk about scholarly writing, you know, you are um, talking about, you know, publications, you are talking about um, research and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not true anymore. Uh, nurses and midwives engage in, in various forms of scholarly writing and incorporation of these evidences to support how we communicate uh, has become crucial in that when we communicate, we want to inspire a response. And when we communicate, we want to speak a language that funding agencies, that regulators actually understand, and they are able to respond to that kind of communication. And that's why we need this level of integration and marriage. You know, it's no longer the academicians that are required to engage in scholarly writing, but all of us as practitioners. And I can see that some practitioners and clinicians in the room are already asking if you are not um, affiliated with an organization, you know, how do you secure uh, IRB approval? Um, and we, we really need to talk about those because we can link you to institutions, you know, as professors of practice, so that when you submit, you are affiliated with um, an institution. This is critically important as we continue uh, to grow. So there are key principles at the personal level that uh, Stevens in 2019 um, highlighted in her book. Knowing yourself as a writer, understanding the genre of academic writing and you know it related with the audience who are you pitching the communication to or the writing to 
being strategic and building a sustainable practice for writing and of course networking and collaborating seeking others who have the capacity the potential the time uh, to write with you so writing in groups and exploring a creative element in writing which dr rose has also already highlighted um <laughs> This lady, uh, Danielle Stevens, says that, you know, when, when you write more, you publish more, you stress, you stress less. I'm not so sure, you know, how true that is. But one thing that she actually says that resonates with me is the fact that each individual nursing and midwifery scholar has to initiate a journey into writing and they have to start somewhere and the best place to start really is looking at ourselves first so that's why my talk is about exploring more about where you are right now and also determining where you want to be in terms of writing so knowing more about yourself as a writer leads to greater insight to greater awareness and to positive sustainable changes in your scholarly writing for you to be able to do this you need to explore some of your past writing experiences because i'm going to talk a little bit about barriers that we encounter in scholarly writing and majority of these have to do with some of the experiences that we have had in the past and sometimes those experiences have probably been negative and they have ultimately shaped you know, the way we think about writing or even our ability to take some steps forward to start writing, identifying blocks and barriers, and then being able to take positive action towards change as an individual. It needs to start with you. We need more nurses to write. But, you know, before we get there, you know, nurses need to know and have the skills to actually write and that's why we are putting uh, these seminars on uh, for us to be able to explore you know the way you think um, about writing you know what experiences you've had that shape those ideas when we think about writing of course we want to think about what it is that we want to change okay so the way we have always done things, you know, if you are following my little image, <coughs> puts us into this, you know, specific path dependency where you begin to think, I can't write, I can't do anything. There are all of these barriers. This is not available for me and so on and so forth. So for you to begin to think about scholarly writing differently, you need to almost, you know, get out of line you know, <laughs> change in the way you have been thinking about this. And one of the things that I usually use here at CIU when I, I, I talk and orient uh, students is often thinking about your mindset, your tool set and your, your skill set. So what ideas you have, the way your orientation to your current status as, um, as a, an emerging uh, scholarly writer the tools you have and the skills you have and the uh, capacity you have and the structures within your organization uh, to be able to support that. So we want to change by identifying and addressing writing practice barriers. And these, you know, can be multiple, okay? Quite often, our own barrier is the mindset we have about this you know, the I can't do this attitude, okay? I, I meet a lot of nurses and it's almost like a helpless um, approach to, to writing. You know, we, we can't do this. We, we Somehow, if we can't do this, and, and my last slide here, you will see that it's all about can. We, we, we actually can. It just takes us to ad, accept and acknowledge what those personal, barriers are before we actually get to the organizational barriers so 
There are a few personal barriers that we often think in terms of organization when in fact they have everything to do with us as scholars uh, or emerging scholars or uh, as practitioners. The first is rules and regulations. You know, this is a set of beliefs that a writer has about how writing should proceed. Rules involve rigid ways of dealing with writing and rules limit the common understanding that writing is inherently rewriting things, okay? So for you to overcome some of the beliefs that you have about the rules that you have inherently set for yourself, you know, it may be that you are a perfectionist. And as I said, you know, scholarly writing is about writing and rewriting things and rewriting things. And sometimes it's about writing one sentence and feeling like you have accomplished a great deal um, in one day, you know, just getting one sentence written. But sometimes we have these rules in our heads that writing has to be a certain way, a certain rigid approach to write. To writing that actually stops us in our tracks and we are not even able to get to the evidence that Dr. Rose was talking about. Okay, so we need to be able to challenge some of the existing rules that you have established in your own head, in your own mind about scholarly writing. The other is perfectionism. Okay, this is a set of beliefs that a writer holds about the quality of his or her work. And during the writing process, the perfectionist is more likely to belabor the quality of a single sentence for an extended period of time at the cost of attending to the whole manuscript. And you know, I don't know about you, but I tend to fall in that category of perfectionists. And you know, I will look and revise and keep revising and keep revising and keep revising. And I am telling you, if you want to develop and expand the scope of your writing capacity, you just need to stop somewhere, okay? And acknowledge that what you have done is good enough. The other is procrastination. You know, we procrastinate a lot when we are writing. And procrastination is also another set of behavior. And please hear me when I say some are beliefs and some are behaviors. So procrastination is a set of behavior of delaying action on something that needs to be done. Okay, it is made worse, of course, for nurses and midwives and other clinicians, it is made worse by the pressure of deadlines and by the fact that we run busy schedules so we do not have the time and we use this as a hook constantly to not get to writing we are not able to create even 10 minutes out of our day to just write something okay and this also means that we don't have enough time to read and to become astute scholarly writers we also need to create time to read because we can only grow in writing you know, if we are reading other scholars, you know, other scholarly pieces that exist or other reports that exist um, elsewhere. So that is really important that if procrastination is a part of your behavior or part of your pattern, that's one thing to address because it can really prove debilitating and become a stumbling block for you to write. The other is really a writing anxiety. We all have a bit of writing anxiety and a good dose of anxiety is, is enough to push us into where we, where we need to be to start to start writing. But when anxiety um, becomes debilitating and you are not able to actually write, this is a generalized nervousness about writing. When it becomes maladaptive, then we are not able to produce any work. And it's important for us at the individual level to actually identify, you know, I'm, I have anxiety, 
but it is anxiety that allows me to function. Or I have anxiety about writing and it is maladaptive anxiety. I'm not able to overcome this. And then you need to have an honest conversation or join other groups or talk to a mentor, find a way to be able to overcome that block. Sometimes the barriers we have are at the organizational level. So they are not at the personal level, but they are at the organizational level. For example, organizational structure barriers can include organizational cultures that do not support scholarly writing culture. And this includes hospitals and clinics where we work or ministries, you know, or committees where we serve other organizations, but also within academia, you know, an organization or a university that does not create that level of culture to support uh, scholarly writing. Or organizations that do not provide opportunities where nurses and midwives feel that they have the desire, they want to start scholarly writing, but there are no opportunities for them to actually start writing. Or there are no incentives, you know, no promotions attached to writing, you know, why should we write? They, they, we don't see the value, so we need to be able to create an incentive. Or sometimes we, we lack access to skilled mentors. There are no funding support, you know, for scholarly writing, or we simply lack the experience and the track record. All of those uh, can act as blocks or barriers to scholarly writing. And if you are a policymaker in the room, uh, if you are a legislator, um, if you work for professional bodies, you know, if you are you belong to funding agencies and you are in this webinar, um, please, these are areas that we need to address because these are the questions that emerged in, in our previous um, uh, webinar. You know, these structure and organizational barriers need to be addressed for us to move nurses and midwifery on a platform to start writing. And sometimes nurses and midwives are just so busy, they lack time. This is an issue, okay? And we also lack confidence, okay? And sometimes there is lack of access to reading and understanding academic texts, journals, referencing and in general academic jargon scholarly writing you know produces anxiety because we simply don't understand the academic jargon we missed that when we were in school and now we are expected to use this okay in all our writing in all our report writing so it becomes quite um a challenge uh for so many uh, nurses and midwives because writing, publishing, and implementing evidence-based practice are so central to our academic and professional life, Stevens recommends that increasing awareness of yourself as a writer will help to build capacity and it will help you to engage in other activities and opportunities to support and hopefully increase your own scholarly writing okay so we need to be able to um be aware so understanding the genre of writing um dr rose actually really did a good job on on this one um and i just want to highlight a few uh, more things for us you know this helps us to explore what problems we want to solve with what type of writing so understanding your audience will also help you to pitch appropriately. Because I said, you know, scholarly writing is now being integrated into policy briefs, uh, into reports that we have to, uh, to write, uh, into advocacy campaigns that we have to run, uh, like the most recent one uh, for, um, you know, lobbying to get that lunch money and so on and so forth. So what parts of that is actually going to make it uh, into the final report that we are writing? And what kind of language, you know, do we need to use? We need to understand the genre, you know, are they looking more for something creative? Are they looking for an integration of data and storytelling, a mixed methods approach? You want your work to be read. 
Okay, that is the primary reason, really, of if we are going to write something, you know, we want people to read it, but people will keep on reading our work if our work is engaging at all levels. <clears throat> and also, the content that we are communicating needs to be relevant. So, focusing on your disciplinary uh, expertise would actually really help so that we, you are not all over the place. So if somebody asks me to write about mechanical engineering, I am not going to be able to write appropriately about mechanical engineering. I mean, I could write a scholarly piece by looking at the literature, doing a, a, a data synthesis and so on and so forth, but I don't have the expertise. And that means that I'm not bringing my own individual and creative uh, experiences to the piece of writing. So really identify what is your area of expertise and then what answers you know what solutions do you want to see within that area what questions do you want to ask and what stories do you want to tell and then you begin to tell the world about those things so uh, if we want for example to secure funding for professional development in our organization uh, let's assume that you know uh, cpds have been have not been on the menu for many years and now we want to bring cpds back and we want to lobby to get funding for that is a poem uh going to get us what we want you know is a spoken word and a creative music and so on going to get us what we want like what is it what kind of piece scholarly writing do we need to undertake uh, to get us the solution okay the other question to ask is what skills should we master to frame the problem to frame the solution to frame the process and the inputs, to frame the outcome, and to also frame and track the impact of what we do every single day. And I think this is really the area where we needed to discover our scholarly and creative voice, and we need to write and disseminate information. One of the things that I've been talking about, if you've been attending the webinars or in, in the leadership webinars that I hold every month, is the fact that you know, if we continue to say, let me give you an example, we continue to say that nurses and midwives are the backbone of the healthcare system. Somehow that sentence should inspire action for so many policymakers and organizations, they should be able to subsequently, therefore, invest in nurses and midwives because they are, as we are saying, the backbone of the healthcare system. But it seems that that line really has been overused and yet it doesn't seem to inspire the level of response that we are looking for which means that it's a challenge for us as nurses and midwives who are also writing to reframe what does that really mean and now to lean into dr rose's uh dr charlo's presentation so what kind of data do we need to present in our scholarly writing and in our reports and in our policy briefs that expand that sentence in a meaningful way otherwise it becomes right one of those sugar coating it's a sexy statement to say nurses and midwives are the backbone of the healthcare system then why aren't we getting the level of investment that we need why aren't we getting more nurses and midwives being sponsored you know to pursue advanced education why aren't we funding scholarly work for nurses and midwives, you know, because they are the backbone. So that for me, that is, that's the foundational structure of everything, of all the outcomes, of, of the end goal of the healthcare system. It hinges on there's 80, more than 80% of this workforce. So it means that the way we are framing both the problems for the nursing and midwifery profession, the solutions, the processes and inputs of our work 
the outcomes and the impact of our work, as well as tracking that impact, somehow we are missing the boat when it comes to that. And that's why we need to develop these competencies, understanding ourselves and it, starting on this journey, however difficult it may be, okay? It is a call to action for every nurse and midwife in this room to start to think about how we can rewrite and reframe our story using scholarly writing that is recognized and respected and will inspire the kind of action and investment that we are looking for. So the last is the strategic actions to build a sustainable scholarly writing practice. And I love using this uh, uh, slide always because I think in images, I always feel like, you know, I need, <laughs> I need the GTO, you know, I need the screwdriver, I need the tools, I need the nails and what, what are those, you know, going to be. And one of the things that came up in the reading as I was preparing for this was, you know, being able to join a writing group is a very good tool, but also sustaining it, okay? And lobbying for writing camps. We needed to create, you know, these are intensive spaces where nurses and midwives can take time off away from their busy schedules to really just sit down with these ideas and practice writing. And then the other thing is don't just attend a conference, you know, actually network and identify who these mentors are going to be for you. Um, and I put in here, you know, determine the type of group you want so that you get some accountability or is it a reflective feedback? Or are you looking for champions, you know, who are going to reward you for your progress when you start writing? How many people are you collaborating with? Because that's also really important. When to meet and how often to get and to give, you know, so don't expect to just receive, but are you able to actually contribute meaningfully? Um, who is the convener of these groups? Uh, is it a rotational or shared leadership? What do you do with the members who do not contribute? Determine how to achieve consistency. I know that these are all really important ideas because I belong to a writing group and we really have struggled to maintain consistency. And these are really important elements of our ability to continue to grow in writing. Uh, Florence, I need two more minutes and then we will go to questions. So assemble your tools. Um, one of the big biggest tools that nurses and midwives are struggling with, and this cuts across, it doesn't matter what your age is, is really technology, harnessing technology. We are going to become competent writers if we are able to use ICT and leverage ICT. And, you know, so search and retrieval skills, you know, are important, but you need to be comfortable, so develop a degree of comfort. And I know that this leads back to those organizational structures and elements that are supportive. Do you have access to computers? Um, do you even have access to a course that will allow you to understand basic rules of how to search uh, for data, how to search for evidence, how to search for literature, and so on and so forth, you know. So then the other is our platforms. You know, where are you sharing uh, your information? How do you become a published uh, scholar? Uh, going back to those groups, uh, joining and, you know, writing to universities and requesting to be um, a professor of practice so that you have an appointment so that you can work in collaboration uh, with academicians to grow your own writing, but to also bring your own research from, uh, from practice, you know, because you want to foster evidence-based practice. Finding champions, you know, who can support you uh, to do this. And then, of course, you know, practice practicing, practicing. I read a book once entitled, Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins. And this is a book by Simmons called How to Use Your Own Stories to Communicate with Power and Impact. And I think Dr. Rose made a good point there. So, but for us to be creative, we need, you know, to define both the capacity, 
you know, as well as uh, two things there, the experience, you know, we need the capacity and we need the experience of writing and we cannot get the experience of writing until we actually start to write. And as I said, a fresh perspective is needed in the way we are framing the problem, the solution, the inputs, the impact and the outcome. And finally, hey, to do scholarly writing, we really need to start and get your scissors out and cut that T off and say, I can. Positive reinforcement, okay? I can. And then we can move on from there. If you think you can, which I believe you can, then we can start talking about opportunities that are available for you to start to write. But you really need to start with you, understanding your strengths, understanding the barriers, analyzing what those are, and then strategically addressing those, whether at the personal level or at the organizational level. And I hope that this has been helpful to you. Now back to you, Florence. We are happy to take questions, both myself and Dr. Rose. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose uh, Clark, and thank you so much, Dr. Rose Navigate. I think that has been really wonderful. We already have some, uh, some, some words of encouragement uh, about how good this, this has been. And I'm really pleased that uh, some of the questions that I'm reading in the chat uh, following from our previous uh, webinar, uh, that tone was, oh, oh we are, we are, we're not doing well, no one listens to us. But now I see an improvement from that to how do we start? How do we get this? Which I think is a really good place to start. We have some hands. So I uh, will take a couple of hands. We'll take the first, the hand, and then we'll take some questions. So let me read some few uh, questions and then we take the hand and then we will move on from there. So um, Dan, Dan was asking, uh, was asked, need, needed some highlight on how to write case reports, which is really key because this is a good place to start as uh, many of the nurses and and, and healthcare providers start with patients and they have interesting cases that they would wish to write about. So uh, pointers on how that can be written, that can be done, writing cases. And then um, Philip's asking about uh, ethics reviews and RRBs and, and how they can support nurses in their hospitals. And then we need, uh, and then Isaac is asking about the same thing. How can getting RB approvals is very challenging? How can nurses and midwives be supported so that their works are published? And then we'll have the hand from Cliff. Yes, Cliff, please proceed. My microphone. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, really very excited to join this group. My first time to join the, the webinar, and I'm sure I missed the first one, which I'm, I'm, I'm really eating to know the details. Um, you have the two Dr. Rose Clarks, two Dr. Rose Clark, Chalo and, uh, and, uh, and Rose Clark. You have brought a very important aspect of advocacy uh, in the light of, uh, on the light of this country where quite many problems need to be addressed. And many times I, I see nurses only complaining, raising complaint that this is not enough, this is not good, this is not correct. And I think Dr. Rose brought it very clearly that we should move away from complaining. We should find solution, which is a very great thing. Now, my, my, my observation and my experience has actually shown that we have a big barrier in terms of the people who are holding position of authority, in terms of them accepting some of the innovations to be implemented, in terms of them encouraging the nurses to really drive these changes. My biggest question is how do we begin to change that narrative of resistance and not looking at innovation and not encouraging you know, young innovative, innovative people to really try to set a new direction of how we can address our problems. Because if we continue the current space in which we are moving, where only particular people need to make decisions to allow certain things to happen, I'm sure our efforts of advocacy 
will always be complaining and will always be just on the road and it will not be translated to practice. And I want to see that this advocacy session that you are carrying needs to be translated into, into practice, it needs to be tra translated into changing the wrong, the bad things that are really affecting our patients, the bad experiences that we are having. How do we begin to change this direction to ensure that nurses are able to resolve problems, nurses are able to provide solutions in the narrative of writing a scholarly paper in that direction? Because many nurses have done great research, researches and these researches are lying down and they're not being implemented into policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atlee. Um, perhaps we, we, we take those for our start and then we, we take the other question. So the first one is uh, writing a case report. Uh, another one is on RB approvals and then um, not being ethics of that and not being attached to any, any facility or institution, and then how to change the direction where nurses provide solutions as Cliff uh, has mentioned, where their solutions can be implemented. And then we'll take another set of questions. Um, Dr. Shialo, do you want to go first on that case report? Okay. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Cliff, and all the others for your questions. How to write case reports? Yeah. Um, I would imagine, uh, because you, you know we do the nursing process, so we can start from there. If you are dealing with a patient, you have taken, it is like summarizing what you have you know, done from your nursing process, okay? This person, especially if you are writing, not giving the medical bit, because what is lacking is actually our nursing and midwifery care. So if we are talking about a case report, uh, maybe um, a patient was diagnosed. You know, sometimes we do nursing care or our nursing interventions and actually patients get better. So you start by, by putting notes, writing what you really did to this, to this patient. Okay, I came, I assessed, this was the case. I, I made my nursing diagnosis as such and this was my plan and when I implemented and when I implemented and this patient got better or something like that. I don't know, uh, <laughs> Rosie, Rose, you, are, you are a better teacher than I am, I, I think. You may be able to, to explain better, but the case reports will be just exactly what you have done. And it would be better if we are writing nursing interventions to show people that actual business interventions have made a difference. Thank you. Yeah. Rosie, you can um, pick I think, there. well, the, 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 I think that writing a case report is actually a, 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 a simple um, uh, thing. However, it's people really struggle with where to publish uh, clinical case reports. Uh, because, I mean, the, the structure of the um, case reports is, is, is slightly simpler. You, you need an abstract, you need an, introdu an introduction, you need the case itself, you know, and then, of course, you need the discussion where you integrate uh, the case findings within an existing body uh, of research. Uh, sometimes nurses, uh, I think, uh, m more so than doctors, don't realize that uh, every thing that they observe, like unusual observations that they see on the ward, advanced responses to therapies, um, uh, that th those are an opportunity for a case report, often because <coughs> majority of these cases are, are obscured in, in disciplinary um, inquiries, you know, which diverts the attention and the energy away from actually writing this as an interesting case report and the nurses and midwives are just caught 
um, in the, you know, uh, not even an appreciative inquiry, you know, who did this, why did the, the medication uh, error, uh, error occur? And then the inquiry ends there. It doesn't proceed to, can we actually write this as a case summary report uh, that can be disseminated for other organizations and clinicians to learn? Um, sometimes, uh, you know, cases and observations lead to, um, co you know, conditions that lead to confusion. And in private sector, sometimes to litigation. So people don't even want to do case reports because hospitals don't want to uh, identify with the case, uh, especially if the case has uh, a negative negative uh, outcome okay um, and then sometimes of course you know cases if if a nurse has been so um, involved in the care do we lose objectivity uh, to write that particular case um, and it, it, sometimes it may require you to bring some other people in uh, so that you can ring fence your emotions to write the case report. So, but the guidelines on, on how to write a case report uh, are available uh, online depending on where you want to publish it. One way to encourage nurses and midwives to do case reports is to actually start with the organization uh, itself. So you are writing for, you know, for the postmortem of the case for the organization to improve practice and to influence policies, organizational policies and procedures that you could change to improve practice. That's an evidence-based approach. And then from there, you can then seek to write case reports to publish them in journals. And each journal will have a specific way for you to do that. In terms of um, RRB approvals, uh, really the best advice that I have is that uh, majority of hospitals are not teaching hospitals, which means they don't have a university attached to, to them. So I would encourage that uh, hospitals where you work, seek a memorandum of understanding with a, an existing university, particularly a university that has an IRB attached to them, because that would help expedite um, IRB approval. And of course, I want to offer Clark International University. We have an IRB, but I also know that Makerere does, um, Barara does, uh, some, I think Soroti or Gulu uh, also have. So a hospital near you, we need to, you need to have a memorandum of understanding. That way we can encourage midwives and nurses in that hospital uh, to be able to pursue IRB approval expediently um, rather than, you know, having no options. And then back to um, uh, uh, Cliff, thank you so much. Uh, for raising those are really important questions to ask. Um, I think I had a slide in my presentation uh, that really emphasizes why we need to reframe the problem and to reframe the solution. I think that part of our uh, challenge right now, a biggest barrier for nursing and midwifery is that we are recycling the same narrative. And as I often say, you know, doing the same thing and expecting a different result is truly the definition of madness. And, and I, I won't mince words when I say we need to reframe, we need to, the narrative, <laughs> it, it is true. Um, and I'm not being harsh. But you know, I've, I've attended webinars and seminars and, um, uh, and, and you know, all the workshops that we have had. And you know, it, it's the same narrative. The other thing that we needed to break is that we needed to stop talking to each other and start talking to other people. Usually, you know, nurses are really good at, we talk to each other. We talk to each other about our problems, nurses and midwives. We talk to each other, you know, about what the barriers are, about what our frustrations are, about what is working, about what is not working. But we are not taking that story and that conversation to actually where it needs to go. 
you know, the policymakers, the legislators, the executive branches, you know, the, the president, you know, needs to understand our story. And this is why we, we are encouraging scholarly writing and storytelling, you know, we need to write these as books. You know, we, we have a few emerging uh, uh, scholars and writers, uh, uh, the pregnancy book uh, author, you know, I've been really, really uh, impressed with, with the work that uh, he has done. Um, and, and that is really changing practice and changing ideas. But really, Cliff, I think part of what we need to do is let's stop talking to each other. And now let's frame the story for the world, you know, to understand what our issues are. I think that we will generate better solutions and we will get better champions if we are able to do that. But we need the capacity and the skills to frame that story appropriately so that people can listen and it can inspire solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. And Dr. Florence. Before, yes, before, before you allow the other hands, uh, talking about uh, IRB, I didn't talk about it. Uh, what I said, the, the, because there are so many institutions which have accredited IRBs, institutions mm -hmm. which, are, which may not be academic institutions, uh, hospitals, research, uh, research organizations, they have IRBs. So the nurses, the only barrier I see is that is the fee, because they actually charge, and it's a lot of money, and the, uh, mostly they charge in dollars, even in some IRBs. Yeah, so um, that's the the only barrier I can see. But you can you can submit your work to any accredited IRB. I know you can submit and you can get approval for it. The only barrier is the money. Thank you so much. That's what I wanted to add on. And thank you, Dr. Rose Clark. This talking to each other is too much. Sometimes I read on the, on our groups and I'm like, we are complaining to ourselves. Every time complaining, we need to talk to other people, to outsiders, as she has said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles. So I have two hands. Uh, before I let those hands in, um, as someone, uh, Odong wanted uh, pointers on writing groups that you can join. There are several that have been uh, written up in the chat. Kindly follow the chat. Uh, Tracy is going to post something about uh, the, uh, the nursing group, writing group. And then uh, someone would like advice on how to write. I think that's um, Dr. Innocent would like pointers on how to write a concept note. On how to write a concept note. I think Odong's point of lack of collaboration has been uh, highlighted. He, he cites lack of collaboration where one tends to have to write a paper alone. And perhaps what you said about um, someone mentioned mentorship and um, and how to support young writers to be able to start, uh, if you could talk about that briefly. And then um, one, one, one issue that I had was levels. What, what I, one, one issue I wanted, I would have liked you to highlight one is those levels of engagement and levels of involvement. So if someone wants to write, what are the levels of involvement from where they are, from the institution? So if it's, an, let's say, an intern or, or whatever level they are, are there any levels of involvement of the hospital board? How are they, what can they just write or who do they need to talk to to be able to move forward the writing agenda? Because yes, we may be able to go out and write, but can we speak of those levels of authority that we need to traverse to be able to bring papers out in case someone wanted to write and then the paper comes out and, and they are scolded for not consulting the hospital board about publishing this paper. So you probably need to talk about that. And then I'll take the hands from Dan and from Isaac. Let's start with Dan. Dan Thank you, you Florence. Me? Yes. Am I audible enough? Yes, you are. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar. And uh, thank you for the choice of the presenters you, you arranged for us today. The discussions are so good. 
And uh, I think I will name one of my kids zeros. I think there is a magic in the name because that's the name you represented for us today. But uh, my question is, uh, is it possible to arrange a topic that, that is well focused and uh, targeting most of the problems that people have during writing? I realize that uh, in square writing, most people find it hard to design a study. The methodology part is normally the challenge. And sometimes even when we have problems, we fail to, to write the problem very well such that we address it to the readers in case one wants to buy in your write-up. Is it possible to have a focused problem-oriented learning such that we bridge the gap that, that is uh, hindering us to write? Thank you. Thank you. Isaac and then Ruth. Thank you. I want to appreciate the, the two presenters and the chair of the session. This is really very, very encouraging. And I could say I'm learning new things every day. And uh, I want to appreciate our icons in the nursing fraternity, the two Dr. Rose and others who are not in the forum for all their efforts that they are putting in place to ensure that nursing gets its rightful recognition. Uh, Dr. Rose Charlo had already talked about the fee. That's one thing which I wanted to bring about the fee for the IRB. Because most of the nurses do the write-up, but when it comes to the fee bid, it is a challenge. I don't know if... Uh, our colleagues, our seniors, Dr. Rose Clark, Dr. Rose Jalo, and other, I've seen also my senior Cabanero saying that, uh, care you also asked that, whether there can be some kind of subsidies for the nurses so that whatever they are writing can be, uh, so that they can help, you know, as a way of promoting the, 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 them to carry out to scholarly writing or publication. Then number two, Dr. Rose Clark, you have said we should stop talking to ourselves. I think it is now a good time that we need to come up with the strategies. I don't know what you people have in place for us to scale this down or scale it up rather, to scale it to the, to the other nurses across the country so that we could start with the issues of documentation and improve it better for our people. Then, yeah, I agree that there's need for some madness and the madness needs us to get out of our comfort zones and, uh, and go to the unknown zones. I think this is a, a well-stated word. You are not Ash, Dr. Ross Clark. It is something that we require because uh, in my village, they say if you are a, a, a man, you don't go home. If there's battle, you don't run to the bush, you run to the battlefield. And currently, nurses are having a challenge. Countrywide, there's no recognition, no nothing. People just are in despair. But I think it is time that we should run to the front line and say, hey, we are here and we are ready to combat. I, I want to agree with the, what Dr. Ross talked about to use of data, Dr. Ross Charles. I remember me and Cliff, before the industrial action, we initiated something about the welfare of nurses, but unfortunately, the data that we generated was not used. However, it would have been proven much more better that our negotiations would have been much more you know, visible if the data was used in the process of negotiation. So that is also another thing. But now going forward, I also want to seek this your guidance, man, my seniors, that what can we do? Is there any form of a session that could be organized to help us when we are going maybe for TV presentations or radio talk shows on how to package the information so that we don't look as if we don't know anything but really stand for the course that we are going for? I thank you all.
Florence, you are muted. Um, I think it was Kemi. Sorry, yeah. yes, for, from yeah. Kemi Ruth, can we get the last, the, the last question before we give our panelists a chance to respond? Okay, thank you very much for the webinar. My, my input is I think nurses have been, uh, we've been brought up to be subordinate. We've not been uh, taught to challenge the process. We've not been trained to encourage the heart. We've not been trained to lead the way. We are taught to act on doctor's orders. So my background, I did a psychiatric nursing certificate and I branched immediately to clinical medicine because um, I felt like my lecturers and the nurses at the wards didn't inspire me enough to continue my nursing career. So I went to IHSU and I saw these nurses, uh, they really loved what they did. And I wished, I wished I had someone to encourage me. I would have done my bachelor's in nursing. So, um, so uh, I went to Alive, I practiced my clinical medicine for four years before I joined UN. This is what happened. Um, because I got a chance immediately from clinical medicine to go and do my pediatric palliative care. And it is headed by nurses uh, and some doctors, but these ladies are so powerful and they show you that anything can happen. So I come, I come and tell the nurses we are working with that, you know what? The doctor walks in in the morning to just check on the patients and they go away, you're in charge of this place. Don't let the doctors step on you. Let them, if they're working, let them work with you and with the patients. You cannot be there when you don't even know the diagnosis of the patient. You know, they're like, we cannot do that. So I held, uh, I came with some book about research and everything. I told them, there's so many things you can do. You have a patient who's stage three, stage four. You can observe this patient and write a case study. But it's a tug of war. What did I realize? That I think our background um, in lecturing, there's so much that needs to be changed. How do the lecturers, first of all, encourage the students? Do you just rubbish me around? Do you torture me? Do you show me, you know, you go to the ward and someone just tells you, go and shave that patient. It's, this patient is a psychiatric condition, you know? Treat me in a way that inspires me to wake up in the morning and know that it is very good for this patient to be camped. But you're, you're like, it's like you're, you're punishing me. So when we're doing clinical medicine, we are placing Kawolo. And the midwife said, uh, touching this fecal matter, because you'll start ordering me around. I was like, oh my God, this lady is so bitter, you know? So we need to rewrite so many things. As we are talking about uh, the, the, the things, how can we do this? We need to go back to the table because uh, there's, there's so much down there that needs to be uh, clear. There's so much training that needs to be go, to be taught to the lecturers that this is someone who's going to show out what you've taught them. So you need to encourage them. Uh, then then uh, the, the, now I'm, I got a job as a nurse, you know? And uh, now I'm feeling what a nurse is, but because I managed to go through the leadership training, I managed to do this and, you know, some a doctor wants to step on me I just insist in a polite way. I say, Doctor, no. You, 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 after working on uh, with your uh, waste, I've put for you sharp container. Then you, you, you put it on the tray and you're telling me, put it in the sharp container. You know, then the nurse will be like, Yeah, the doctor has ordered. You know, that, that's when we are supposed to write, to write, to, to, to you know, to write. Order, tell them, Doctor, no. I bought for you a sharp container. Please put the syringe, the needle and syringe in a sharp container. 
so there is so much that needs to be worked on. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Ruth, for that. So uh, let's allow our, our panelists to respond to some of those few questions before we wrap up. Um, yes, thank you, Florence. We're actually over by already 13 minutes. We were supposed to um, end at um, 4.30. This was the one uh, hour and a half. So um, Dan raises uh, a very good question um, about the targeted training. So Dr. Chalo, um, myself, and I think Mr. Cliff, um, if he can join us in our next webinar, um, to focus briefly on the concept note, uh, the case note, the critique of a published paper, the methodology. So I think, you know, from these webinars, we are picking uh, specific topics that we can then uh, build the next webinar on. Uh, so from those topics that have emerged, uh, we can create our next writing webinar uh, specifically on those particular targeted areas of learning, you know, really going a deep dive on, okay, how do you put a concept note together? How do you put a policy brief together? How do you put a case note together? How do you critique a published paper? You know, and how do you write a, the methodology section, for example, um, a deep dive on that. Uh, so those are really good topics. I think every nurse, uh, every senior nursing officer and other scholars here would like to uh, pursue those. I would like to, uh, of course, ask uh, Mr. Cliff, uh, Dr. Rose Chalo uh, to join us uh, in our next webinar uh, on uh, one of these topics and for Ms. Florence to continue to host the IRB, uh, the fees, uh, again, I think that if you are collaborating with a teaching institution, uh, so some of those uh, costs can be negotiated or reduced or they can be trade-offs. For example, um, training institutions place students at uh, hospitals uh, for clinical placements and we are always charged a fee. And one of the ways that I'm looking uh, for these trade-offs is you know, if we have a memorandum of understanding, can we have that as a trade-off where we are able to place our students at the hospital and the nurses are, uh, are mentoring these students, but then those nurses are participating in research and then it offsets uh, the uh, cost of the IRB. Uh, all of that can be worked out, I think, in, in a memorandum of understanding. In terms of writing groups, I think it's important for senior nursing officers, senior midwifery officers, to really lobby to start a writing group at your own organization, make it multidisciplinary, include doctors and other uh, uh, um, scientists uh, in the group so that you can start somewhere. Um, I think we cannot really uh, prescribe what your organization can do, but that is an organizational structural barrier for you that we, you need to overcome. And I think that if we do that, you know, organization by organization, then nurses within those organizations can feel like if they are going to publish, the writing group has looked at the work and, you know, they don't feel like they are publishing information that the hospital is going to turn around and say, how could you, how could you publish this information uh, outside there? Um, that's all I have to say. We are really, really have run out of time. So I'll give the uh, last word to Dr. Rose and then back to you, Flores, to wrap it up. Thank you, namesake. Um, <laughs> Um, I will just address, I think you have addressed most of all of them. Except, um, I just want to talk about uh, the last uh, uh, comment by, was it Ruth? Yes. Was it Ruth? The, the, the background, the way we are brought up as nurses. Uh, you realize that um, before we had certificate and diploma, data and that was the, the trend the thinking that we work ag against doctors orders but after realizing i think with the bachelor's training i think the thing that the trend should have changed although we still have those um, 
elements on the words. Even last week, my students were telling me that, uh, you know, uh, our colleagues, uh, the, the medical students, they laugh at us that we are doing nursing. They call us sisters. I think it should start with us to change this, this mindset, to encourage our students, to change even the way we, we treat others. If we are senior nurses on the wards, if you are the senior principal nursing officer or assistant commissioner heading the nursing division, you should talk to your nurses and, it, and you know, encourage them to change. This attitude thing is very, very big. It's very big, but we, it should start with us to change, to cut that tea and let people enjoy the nursing so that we can even, um, other people should join us, the young ones. For me, I think uh, before that training, because now the nurses are empowered. If you tell me to give it, to order me to do something. One time um, when I was still in Makere, one of our students, the, the doctor reported and said she was arrogant. The student was very difficult. And when we asked what had happened and she was like, they told me to make tea and I told them that that was not my job. Since here, <laughs> yeah, yes that. Because you are not there to make tea for them. If you, 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 you refuse in a polite way and they will understand. So we need maybe to, to teach ourselves how to, be, to receive, to be assertive, to let people know our role, not to think that we are there to, to, to carry on doctor's orders. Yeah, and, and uh, I have also seen, uh, our, the other example was a master's student in midwifery. They argued with the doctor, the, the doctor was doing, was actually going to kill the patient. And this girl said, no, you can't do this. And the other one said, but I'm a doctor. But she said, no, you are, what you are doing is wrong. Let me call the senior what? The consultant. And when they argued it out, the, the, the midwife was right. So we have, once you know what you are doing, that is the best, the best, what do they call? Ama, use your knowledge, show that you understand, you now do uh, pathophysiology and so on, and show the doctors that you actually understand what you are doing and they will respect us and they will stop ordering us around. But then ask the nursing, the seniors, we are the ones making the young ones feel bad because we mistreat them. Let's change that because we shall find ourselves in their hands. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Uh, um, thank you for those that have stayed with us. Thank you for everyone that's been able to join this webinar. And uh, we hope that you can join the next one on, a, on and join in on the well. And um, I hope we've learned something. As Dr. Ross says, we need not wait to get to gain insights. Start now. Let's start with what we have, and it can be improved as we go along. Um, in terms of mentorship, we have we've been we've been engaged in a group here. Find someone to work with. If there's someone you think writes better, it may be a peer, it may be a mentor, it may be someone that's that's teaching you or someone in a different department, start with that one, write a piece, share it with your peer, ask them what do you think about this? How can I improve it? And that's how we'll start writing. Thank you so much for being here and uh, I hope you can join us next time. Have a blessed weekend. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Florence, for hosting us and all any male presenter, uh, who is interested in participating in our uh, writing webinars or our leadership webinars, please don't hesitate to contact us uh, uh, at, um, should, should I leave my email or Florence, do you wanna leave your email? Let me just write my email in the chat. 
Okay. Okay, so, we are dropped, so that's we are my email email. coming up. Excellent. Uh, so there is the email. Uh, please contact us. Thank you, Dr. Rose uh, Chalo. Uh, God bless. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week again in the leadership uh, webinar. Uh, another deep dive on uh, advocacy <coughs> with uh, Sister Irene Sevier, who is the former director of nursing at uh, International Hospital Kampala. God bless. Thank Good you. night. Bye -bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Bye bye. In June, hello. Thank you.